Okay. So again, this is uh, Todd. I am uh, a person who started uh, something called Friends at NVLD Awareness, and uh, I am pleased to host this teleconference uh, this evening with uh, Judy Lewis. Um, this is the first of what I hope to be a series of free monthly teleconferences for parents uh, of children with uh, uh, NVLD or NLD, a nonverbal learning disability. Um, a little bit about uh, this Friends of NVLD Awareness, uh, which, which, I, which any of you are welcome to, to participate in. Again, it's kind of a loose association of parents. Um, we're seeking to enhance awareness, information, research, support, treatment, uh, et cetera, for NVLD. Um, in 2014, uh, uh, we supported the production of an informational video, which some of you may have seen uh, online now, called Understanding Nonverbal Learning Disorder. Uh, it's available free on YouTube. Those are being uh, planned, considered right now, and uh, you're all welcome to join that if you want to uh, contact me. Uh, the email is nvldawareness at gmail.com. Uh, the topic for the this teleconference tonight, which should last about 45 minutes, might run a little over, is uh, what parents need to understand about children with NVLD. And as I mentioned, there will be a Q&A at the end of the conference. Um, so before Judy comes on, I want to introduce her. Um, you know, very rarely in your life you come across a person with a, a special gift that can really transform other people's lives for the better. Um, and uh, I truly believe that Judy is, is such a person. And I think some of you on the phone who, who, know, who have dealt with her probably feel the same. Um, Judy has worked since 1999 with the parents of children with NVLD, probably over 200 families, coaching them on how to understand the unique needs and talents of their children, uh, developing successful strategies for improving their children's lives as well as their own. Um, Judy was trained as an educator, not a health professional, uh, her, her opinions are not medical advice, but I think you'll find they're priceless. Um, Judy has an active practice working uh, from California uh, by phone, one-on-one uh, -on -one with parents across the country, uh, and she's very kindly offered her time uh, to do this series of webinars uh, starting with tonight. Um, the first uh, part of the conversation will really uh, go over some of the basics of Judy's approach uh, to NVLD um, and, and working with, with families of children with NVLD. And so with that, I'm going to ask Judy to, to jump in and, um, uh, and join us. Are you, with, are you on now, Judy? Yes, I am. Great. Um, so really, Judy, uh, you know, the first question I was hoping you, you could, you could uh, answer is really, in a nutshell, kind of how did you get involved with, uh, with, with NLD? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I had been a tutor for 30 years, and um, in all that time, uh, I had never heard of NLD. Um, the only time I heard it mentioned was when I was giving, helping give a conference in our community, and uh, there was a woman invited to speak. Uh, she came from Vermont, and she was speaking on the subject, and... Truthfully, I found myself thinking that she didn't know what she was talking about, and I seriously mean that, and I was supposed to be an expert in learning disabilities. Um, so uh, when I asked um, a uh, colleague about it, she um, was telling me that this was real, it was there, but it meant nothing really to me until three years later when I was called in to consult at a small school in our area and um, thought I would just come in for a couple of hours and tell uh, the heads of the school, you know, my observations, what I thought was happening with the kid. This was a girl, her name is Melissa. She was, uh, had been at the school since she was in nursery school. She was now in eighth grade. Um, they had pulled her from all her classes and put her uh, upstairs in this library, a very nice library, but she was all by herself, uh, supposedly learning all by herself. And um, when I got there, um, it ended up that she was in tears just about every other minute that she was talking to me. 
And I could tell as I began to work with her what she didn't have. I knew she was not dyslexic. I could tell that she didn't have ADHD. But I also knew something was going on. So um, when I was in my car driving home, I called this same colleague who had worked with Melissa before, and she told me, well, Judy, this is NLD. And I went, oh, my God. I just couldn't believe it. So this was before the Internet. There was no, no information out there for me. Um, I did have a recording from uh, the conference uh, a few years be before, and luckily I was able to find it. And I played that recording every day going in and coming back out uh, of the school. And instead of um, ending up and which uh, saying, conference, what, which conference are you referring to, Judy? Oh, this was a conference that uh, we put on with the school that I helped start, Chartwell School, and um, it was uh, a school, uh, a conference, probably in 1990, that where we had some really great uh, people come and uh, speak, but um, that's what it was. So, okay. Um, Anyway, what happened was instead of uh, I was so disturbed by watching how the teachers were talking about her and, and, and handling her and how the kids were approaching her that um, I decided I had right then and there I had to do something about this. And so it ended up I stayed and worked with her from October, which is when I was called in, until June. And so I got firsthand um, experience with NLD um, very, very easily, and I worked with her for many years thereafter. Uh, I just wanted to give her back some of her self-respect and to make things a little better for her, ease her, her feeling about the world. And uh, while her parents um, weren't able to really help that much, um, they, um, they supported what was going on. And the teachers were um, just really, they just didn't have a clue. Um, so that happened to be the year that Sue Thompson had just self-published her book. And in those days she called it, I Shouldn't Have to Tell You, which was really the perfect title. Uh, and uh, by some miracle it happened that she lived up in Northern California, not too far from me. And so I became involved in um, uh, a group that she was uh, heading, and that went on for a long time. And here I am 18 years later, <laughs> still very passionate about the work and about all the individuals who uh, really uh, have this hard time with being misunderstood. So I just continue my mission to help others and help people understand the struggles and be able to use some practical strategies to work that that really work to make um, life easier and as you said Todd you know I'm an educator so I come from that uh, world and having had years of experience and a lot of knowledge to share um, I look forward to um, this kind of practical approach uh, very very different from clinical approach uh, everything works if it if it helps the kid it works um, so um, tonight I was going to focus on how to message our sons and daughters or our clients or our students with NLD. Uh, we know their brains are wired differently. All of our brains are wired differently. In this group, I think it's really important that while they have different profiles, of course, as we start to understand um, our own child and how that child works, then we can um, get through and do some really good successful work, make life easier and more successful for them. Sure. And, the, and before we get more into how you work with the, the uh, families, parents, um, could you talk about some of the complexity of NLD? Um, Sure. Um, how it impacts uh, social, emotional, academic uh, yeah. parts of a, a child's life and a family? Sure. Um, you know, the thing that makes it so difficult is that, you know, this is a syndrome of assets and deficits. And we know that our kids have a lot of assets. 
and we know that they do well, and we know that you know that IQ doesn't really matter. There, many of these kids are really bright. Many are gifted. If they're not gifted altogether, they have lots and lots of gifts to to add. Um, on the other hand, there are some places uh, that they are really impacted in a challenging way, and um, these fall into different domains. There's um, you know, the visual, spatial, organizational, there's the social, emotional, there's the motoric where they have the coordination, some of them, and some of the graphical motor uh, handwriting problems. Then a lot of these kids have this sensory problems. Uh, it can be a visual overload, auditory, tactile, um, even taste, uh, olfactory. And um, then separate but integrated into all of this is the executive function problem, which many, many of these kids have, uh, so that they, you know, um, have a hard time planning, having initiative, uh, assigning priority, um, you know, regulating, and uh, having inhibition um, problems and you know, um, all, all, uh, lots and lots of stuff into the, into the executive function, and that's, a, that's actually a conversation all in itself. Um, so it makes it really tough because I often call these kids the missed kids. Very often they are misdiagnosed, first of all, and then they are very, very misunderstood by everyone everyone oftentimes starting with the family who want so much to understand but they sometimes don't and many times they've tried a lot of things and it, they don't work there's the school there's the outside world that can be a congregation with the best intentions many psychologists uh, don't really know about NLD. You know, just look at me all those years ago. I was an educator. I'd been working for years with kids. Never met a kid with NLD. I was clueless. So, uh, yeah, so it's, a, it's really tricky and complex and um, exciting because there are things that can be done, and um, that's the message that I want to get across. Sure, sure. And... Um, Obviously, you know you've you've chosen to work uh, with parents uh, uh, rather than the child, um, and w why is that? Well, it's interesting because I worked with children for 30 years, and I never thought that I would work uh, with the parents, even though I always worked with parents on the side with the children of my tutoring students. Uh, in this case, what I find is that you know parents are the main most important team members for the kids with NLD. And they are oftentimes so baffled by all of this, and they are trying their best to do what they need to do, and yet they find themselves coming up against brick walls. And they want to know, and um, they just find that what they've been doing hasn't been working over time. So. It's my thought that intervention has to start somewhere, and um, when I've found that when we can really get parents involved and interventions, interventionists involved um, in learning what I call a kind of foreign language, how to understand and really be, be able to communicate in a way that gets through to our kids, then things begin to change. And, um, you know, the work itself, in fact, this whole talk tonight, in a way you can think of it as kind of counterintuitive. It's, you know, the way we work with kids who are is just so very opposite than the way we work with kids who have NLD. So if we think of it as a counterintuitive approach, then we're going to know that it's going to be hard sometimes grueling, no doubt about that. Um, it's a different way of thinking. It's a different way of speaking often. 
It's a different way of messaging and a different way of helping others understand. That might be teachers, it might be clinicians, it might be uh, coaches, whoever it is that's working with our kids. So um, the good news is that once the parents become expert at not only knowing the profile of their own child, because of course every child has their own profile, uh, and the diagnosis and um, uh, you know all the clinical information, they can become expert at knowing how to pay attention to their child, his needs, his lexicon of words, and watch what works and what doesn't work. And from that, um, then we get involved in making progress. Because a lot of times what happens is we're trying our very best and we think we're doing it. We're doing this one strategy and we do it again because the kitten, we do it again and then all of a sudden, you know, we think, oh my gosh, this is not working. So I like to say that it's no accident, and many of you heard me say this, when the world gets better for a person with NLD. Because somewhere there's been some good, hard work going on behind the scenes, uh, and the payoff is uh, just everyone's win. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I, I have to say, I can attest to to the things that you're saying and how, uh, you know, the 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 right the right approach, the right words, um, uh, uh, make make a world of difference and can be kind of miraculous. Uh, um, you know, I, I just want to mention also. I know I know you believe that you know you know there are many. There's a team. You know, there are many people who, uh, uh, to be involved. Right. It, it, um, so I don't I don't want to. Give the well, that's okay. That, uh, I'd like to speak to that for a second uh, sure. about the team because the way I look at it is the kid is like the spoke of the wheel. And so what we want to do is we want to grow that team every time we can of charismatic mentors like we call them, of people who understand. We don't want people who are not understanding because what happens is, you know, um, I call it threads of wounding. Our kids have been wounded. They have been misunderstood forever for a long time. The older they are, the longer they've been misunderstood. So we're trying to unwound them one thread at a time. So when we have people who don't understand, it's counterproductive. When we have people who do understand, it makes such a great difference. And for the younger kid, it can be a lot of different people, of course. Um, might be, you know, uh, a psychologist. I've met many psychologists who are right on the mark. I've met many, many psychologists who really, truly don't have any knowledge about this. So it's not their fault that they come across in possibly a way that's not as effective as it could be, even though they're well-meaning. It's that they may not have the information that they need to get through to the kid so that the kid either doesn't balk, quit, self-sabotage, or do some of the kind of negative things that we find our kids doing in which we would rather not have that happen. So I like to grow that team. You know, a one, one um, um, part of the wheel at a time and have the, the whole wheel uh, as complete as we can because we want the kid to have a lot of people in their lives who can be there for them. And it can be young people, too, or it can be older people. It doesn't really matter. It can be grandma. It can be grandpa. It can be aunt, neighbor. doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know you've talked about the parent-child change cycle, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could uh, uh, just describe that. Sure. Okay. So uh, for everybody who's online, some of you already have this in your notes, but if you're going to take notes, um, this would be a great one to draw a visual for yourself. And, <clears throat> you know, this is parent-child change cycle, but it can be teacher-child change cycle, advocate-child change cycle. It doesn't really matter. It's just the idea of helping our kids be able to get off of where they are stuck. Uh, and research from a lot of people um, I find it all the time. I haven't done research, but I find it in my own work that um, 
when when the parent let's use them as the main person when they change we can watch change happen so the the visual goes something like this uh, we put a P at the top at for example 12 o'clock and then make a, an arrow down to three and put the C for child and then make the arrow down in a cycle to, P, to six o'clock and put the P for parent again and continue that up to nine with a C for the child and then back up to 12 o'clock with the arrow. So, um, you know, usually when parents come to talk to me, I call it the desperate stage. They've tried a lot of things. They're hitting their heads up against a wall. They're not sure what to do. And so the discussion comes around um, what can we do to make things better? So what we do, having talked with parents about their particular child, is we begin to strategize about some major thing that's happening. Uh, let's just say that the kid uh, won't go up to bed by himself. Let's just say that's it. Or it could be a number of different things. But usually it's something that's really getting to the parents. And so we begin to talk about at 12 o'clock um, what happens, what they're going to do to try and make things different what they're going to look at, what they're going to say to the kid, how they're going to say it. And so, um, you know, there's so many strategies. We think we're stuck, but actually we're not. We have a gazillion strategies, but we have to be really creative in coming up with them. And to start with, it's a little bit tough. For me, I have no problem with it. I'm always able to just go in and choose a strategy and come up with it and share it. And many, many, many times the family will say they're so happy because that little, tiny, simple strategy was something that worked well. So let's just say that we use that strategy and we do it right because that's the name of this game. And we begin to see a little flex come in with a kid. We've said it right. He's not so rigid. He's able to take it in just a little bit nicely. And we begin to see a small, very small, but small is significant in the world of NLD. And I know that those of you who, you know, are there know this. Big, I mean, let me rephrase. Tiny is gigantic in the world of NLD. Details matter. And so if we do it right, and we see a little give there and a little change, this is good. So now we're at 3 o'clock because we're beginning to see just a little bit of change. So a couple of things happen at 3 o'clock. First of all, the child is less concerned. He's, less, he's more, a little more trusting, a little more open. The parent is a little less nervous, a little less uh, concerned, a little bit more confident. And so as that happens, between three and six, the child is gaining some confidence and the parents also gaining some confidence in trying a little bit more, maybe uh, a little more uh, challenge to the kid that they would not have thought of ever being able to do at 12 o'clock. So they give the kid in this new kind of format, new way of messaging, uh, a little more information, a little more brainstorming, a little more asking of the kid. And um, again, if it's done right, we start to see the child come around. If it is not done right, then we say, okay, it's not because the kid didn't do it right, it's because we didn't do it right. So we need to go back and regroup and think of another, another strategy. I, I, you, some of you may have heard me call it the clown's code. It's a whole conversation, but 
You just go into a pocket and pull a strategy, and you see if it will work. If that strategy doesn't work, then there's no use using the uh, screwdriver when we need a hammer. So we just put the strategy back in the pocket for another time, and we take out another strategy. And again, I'm just going to reiterate that it's not the child's problem. It's our communication problem, our strategic problem. So let's just say that something didn't work. We go back and we find another thing. We try it, and let's just say it doesn't work either. And then we keep trying. And four or five times down the road, we come up with a thing that does work. And then we begin to see some real movement in this, let's say, going up the stairs to, to bed at night. Uh-oh. And when, when we see that happening, that's when there's a real readiness factor. And the readiness factor is a, an exciting time for the kid with NLD because that's when there's no doubt that we've made a kind of progress that is not going to go away. He's decided that he's okay with going up the stairs and going to bed at night. He's comfortable with it. He's practiced it. He's done it. And now we've come around to that, of that particular cycle. Now what I like people to do is, is I like people to put um, parallel horizontal lines in the middle of that cycle. So you've got this cycle or circle, just put some parallel lines right in the middle of it, going horizontally. That's what I call plateaus. And in the world of NLD, there are so many little subsets of skills that we want to help our kids with. There's such a beautiful puzzle with some of the smaller parts of the puzzle pieces missing. And as we put one puzzle piece in at a time and we continue, it, things get really better for them because they've made the accomplishment, and it gets better and easier for us as well. Some things are harder, it's true, and some things are less hard. But the good news is why I love it so much is because it's a hopeful message. There are strategies, always strategies, and we can make them work. So the plateau goes something like this, you know, all right, now we've done this one thing. Now we're going to try for the next one. And I do this a lot in my work. We, we find ourselves having gotten through a number of different things. And um, now sometimes, like with a few families that I'm working with right now, we're kind of dreaming about what it is. This, this girl's got her senior year in, in high school. She's made so much progress. The parents are completely different. When they first called, they were so concerned, they were so worried, the mom in particular. She's so happy with the, where the kid is now that we're talking about what we want for her senior year and, and thereafter because one other important consideration is that we don't want to think about our child when she's 16 or 18. We want to, or 11, we want to think about our child when she's 26 and 36. What is it going to be for her down the road, five years, 10, 15 years? That's what we're working for. That's what we're working towards. So all of these considerations become very important. So as we go around the cycle time and time again, and we look at what we're trying to accomplish, and as you know, uh, I can just speak, I think it's okay to say this, Todd, that we've done this a number of times and um, have been really successful at watching it work. So, um, yeah, that's what the parent-child change cycle is all about. Sometimes I find that, um, you know, it's really hard work for the parents. Um, sometimes teachers will come in and they want to do it, and it's really hard for them. But I've watched teachers do it, and I've seen these amazing things happen when the teachers do it. it like Todd was saying, it's kind of miraculous because our kids want so much to make things work. They're not trying to be what we might call difficult. They don't want life not to work. They want it to work, but they want to be understood. Right. Right. Okay. You know, getting to specifics, you know, you've talked, I've heard you talk about kind of things to do, things not to do. Uh, mm -hmm. I know you have lists of things, you kind of uh, no-nos and, and things to do. And yep. I know it's specific, you know, to, to different situations, but could you talk a little bit about that and maybe give some examples? Sure. 
Uh, well, lots of times what I like parents to do is to start making observations about what works and what doesn't work. And I, I have a notebook that I'm putting together, which I have put it together a long time ago, but I'm about to publish it. And it talks about this very thing. It sounds, again, simple, but if we don't have the information about what works, we know what doesn't work a lot of times, but a lot of times we're not tuned into what does work. And so that in itself can be very helpful. But there's just some primary no-nos, I call them, that are just things that we just really don't want to do. So here's the list. Uh, the first one is condescension, and it goes along with patronization. Our kids cannot stand that. They cannot stand to be condescended to, nor to be patronized. Um, the other one, which is a big one, is they really do not like questions. They do not like to be questions. They do question, and they do not like to be grilled. They love to ask questions, and they love to ask many, many questions, many, many times. Uh, but when we come around to asking questions, they really don't like it. So, uh, and in particular about personal things. You know, sometimes a teacher will ask a, a child to tell them, let's just say, tell me about yourself or tell me about um, something in particular about you that's special. And what Melissa clued me into at one point, she would say, um, you know, well, they're not me. How will they understand? You know, and they see, somehow I've found over the years that our population tends to feel very uncomfortable with this. It's not that they can't do it. Do it. They're good at words and they're good at articulating. But sometimes if we ask them the question, they'll balk. So how do we ask questions? That's a conversation, but there are many, many ways to ask questions without asking the who, what, when, why, where, kind of grilling kind of approach. So basically, just in a nutshell, it's we want to ask the question by basically putting it into a statement. Another no-no is um, giving a kid too much information. Like a lot of families tell the kid everything. Like the family of the girl that I was just talking about, she always wants to know in January where they're going to be going in at Christmas time. And so the parents get caught off guard. Not only do they try to tell her everything, but once they tell her, they may have to change their plans. And so consequently, the girl comes away with too much information, which only makes it a little tricky because she may miscue on it. She may not know what to do with it. Um, and so it tends to overload, which is what we want to stay away from. Um, rushing doesn't work with our kids. We know that in the morning everybody's getting up and it's time to get out of bed and we got to get to school. Um, so that's a tricky one um, when we pick the kids up and we have to rush out or whatever it is. Uh, if you notice, which I'm sure most of you have, Rushing is one of the things that really doesn't work. Nor does uh, the whole sarcasm, criticizing, disrespect comes really like a big bomb for them. They really they tend to think in terms of a little bit of black and white. We're always trying to gray their world out. And um, they've been criticized a lot in the misunderstanding of our children. And so they tend to uh, sometimes not understand sarcasm. It's not that they don't read the nonverbal cue, let's just say, or the tone of voice of sarcasm, but sometimes they will miscue on it. Will they always miscue? Uh, no, they will not. Will they most of the time understand sarcasm? Many times, but not all the time. So we want to be really careful about it because... They come into the world vulnerable just because of the way their brain is wired. And uh, in the world of the neurotypical, we're kind of treating them in our fast-paced manner like, you know, they should be understanding, uh, which goes along with something else that I think I'm going to talk about, which is what I call the deadly assumption. Uh, but without going there right now... Um, I, I should say we're about 40 <laughs> minutes in, um, mm -hmm. and I, I know there's so much to say, 
Um, sure. If you want to take a couple more minutes, maybe then we'll, I think we're going to go right to a Q&A because I, I don't sure. want to run out of time for Q&A. Of course, Q&A. that's great. Uh, all I was going to say, one last thing about uh, one of the no-nos is just giving messages through nonverbal cues like pointing to something or kind of inferring something or being subtle, which we can do with other kids. Uh, with our kids, a lot of times they'll just say, well, why didn't you just say that? Uh, or you can write a note describing it, something like that. So those are those, and so I'm, I'm ready. For okay. And, you know, <laughs> just one other thing that, that comes to mind for, uh, for me, things, another kind of uh, something to do or, or as, as well as, as avoid, um, uh, you know, you, you talk, you've talked about uh, compliment, how uh, hmm. kids don't always want to have a, a compliment um, uh, in, in a, in a, in a uh, in a significant way, but to find another way to kind of uh, mm-hmm. uh, acknowledge, you know, success. You want to just mention something okay. on that? Well, I call it catching them at their accomplishments because complimenting sometimes really backfires. And um, as does overenthusiasm, which is uh, another um, no-no. Our kids don't understand a lot of times when we're overenthusiastic, and so... Uh, they will uh, balk at it. Um, if, if, you know, our kids accomplish so many things during their day that are positive, what we find ourselves doing, and I hear this all the time, is we, we know all the things they're not doing. We're always catching them at the things that they're not doing. We're focusing on those things. Catching them at an accomplishment, if we're really sincere about it and we can be respectful and, and, and authentic about it, is it's hugely um, um, empowering, and it's really wonderful because they don't hear enough of it. And as they begin to capture more and more of what they have accomplished, it builds with them. I call it building chips. It's a long story, but that's what I call it. And as we build those, you know, you can't take away an accomplishment that a child has, has done. On the other hand, you can focus on all the things that haven't been done, and so the accomplishment kind of gets buried. And I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Yeah, I think that's so important, and thank you for, for, for talking about that. So at this point, um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, I, I have not used this system before, so the way I think we're going to do it um, is if, if someone has a question, if you you can unmute yourself, you can hit uh, star five, uh, and you can try to ask a question. I'm a little concerned; maybe multiple people will try at the same time, but we'll we'll see what happens. So if someone has a question, hit star five and uh, fire away. Pat, are you sure it's not star six? Uh, I'm sorry, I gave you the wrong number. <laughs> As I said, this is my first time. It's star six. No wonder. So please hit star six and and uh, ask your question. Hello. Is anyone uh, answer uh, trying to ask a question? No, I may have I may have over muted everyone. Hold on one second. Let me see if I can fix this. Well, actually, everyone is unmuted at this point. So, if someone has something to say or, or ask, please, please go ahead. I have something to say. Go ahead, Jenny. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, this, uh, I'm excited. I will first of all thank you to the group that organized this. Um, I think we need a lot more of this. I've talked with Judy about raising awareness, and I was really excited to find out that there's already an organization called Raising Awareness. And I'd just like to know how, how do we all stay in touch with each other and help raise awareness? How do we, I, I, I think we've, we've been suffering from a lack of leadership on a national level. Um, there are a lot of us you know, around the country that are hungry you know, to share more information, you know, uh, like I said, nationwide. So can anybody speak to that? Um, th- this is Todd. Um, uh, as I put this together, I just, and again, I, I know there are many on the call who have much more experience than I do. Um, 
but I mean, I know, and I, I'm aware that there is a history where there there were there was a lot going on for a while, and then it kind of uh, uh, stopped. Um, I think with all the technology that's out there at this point, I know there used to be an, a national uh, uh, kind of an annual meeting, which would sound terrific. But with all the technology we have at this point, it would seem that things like this, which are you know virtually free um, um, and easy to put together, uh, are one way to go. And I am more than happy to you know to help uh, you know keep this going on a monthly basis. I'm sure there are other ideas out there, so I'll, I'll open that up to anyone. Uh, I, I just, Judy, uh, sorry, uh, Judy was beginning to talk about the deadly assumptions. I was wondering if she can expand on that or give some examples. Oh, I'm sorry. D uh, talking about what was that? You said some assumptions that oh, we make. deadly assumptions. Yeah, that was going to be yeah. something I was going to talk about. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, the thing about it is that D, uh, oftentimes uh, we find that um, team members, caregivers are um, thinking that per the person with NLD gets it. And what I found um, to be true is that lots of times they do get it and lots of times they don't get it. And what the, the, the trick for us is not to make any assumption one way or the other because sometimes we will think they get it and they don't get it. Sometimes we think they don't get it and they do get it. So once again, it's in the way of messaging. So we are going to just be as clear and clean as we can in, in how we, how we um, communicate with our kids. You know, there are times when we can communicate with our kids when everything goes just fine. That's most of the time when we're not talking about anything that's challenging, uh, when we're just talking about uh, some news uh, cast article or some um, information, because our kids are information sponges. They love information. And so when we can do that, we're talking English. When we need to go into sometimes challenging places, we need to be uh, cognizant of where we're going with our words and watching the responses. And uh, again, uh, that's what I mean by the uh, deadly assumptions. They're made all the time. Um, sometimes it can be the simplest thing years old, and we think, well, of course he knows how to, you know, um, make brownies. He's watched me 12 times, but no. He does not know how to make brownies at all. He needs to have some step-by-step -step sequential instruction, and he may have to practice it two or three times. Then again, we think he doesn't know anything about a certain subject, so we're going to need to fill him in when he has heard all the things we're talking about, and he knows very well what we're talking about and can join in to a really good conversation. So... Um, we had, Lynn, Lynn had a, a question that I might want to answer right now, Todd, uh, because sure. it might encompass some of what we're being asked here. Sure, and I think uh, Lynn, Lynn's question, uh, which was sent in earlier, was what, what, what advice would you give someone uh, on a support team, especially for an, uh, a young adult with, with NLD? Mm -hmm. So basically for everybody, knowledge is the key. I mean, that is the key. We want everybody to really learn about NLD. We want them to learn about their own child's um, assets and deficits. Um, you know, people who meet our kids, they know they're different. The child knows they're different. It's not a secret that our kids uh, are a little different. And, and we can, you know, celebrate that if we want to. We, whatever, it doesn't matter. We're all different. But we want the team, we want to help them cut through that invisibility with NLD because these kids pass very well, and sometimes they have strengths in places like a lot of our kids are very good athletes, as it happens. Uh, many of them are super good at the computer, of course. Um, 
you know, so we just want to get as much information as possible, and we want to share information with the team members. Um, we like to give a short version of some article. I've seen parents have entire packets. I even help parents get packets at the beginning. And the te- let's just say it was for a school. The teachers never read a thing. They never read it. It was too overwhelming for them. They're too busy. So one of my favorite articles, um, it's on NLD line, which is um, it's called The Paradox of NLD, and it was put together by a group of um, adults um, who were involved uh, together and put it together. And I, I like it a lot. It's concise and, you know, it, it helps. Um, so the other... The next thing would be to understand that these kids don't trust easily. Why don't they trust easily? Because they've been misunderstood by so many people over so much of their life. Even little kids, seven years old, have learned along the way that it's hard to know who's going to understand them. So how to get over that kind of thing is the old standard of rapport. You know, these words sound trite, but in the world of NLD, these words are not trite at all. It's rapport, respect, acceptance, and I call it triple time, you know, I call it patience triple time. That's my word for it. They're all critical. And the next thing is to know that words are their world. So because our kids don't make pictures quite as well as a lot of neurotypical kids, we like to help put pictures into words and do it in a respectful, non-patronizing way so that we can really have a dialogue going on because they want the information. And then the next one is to give, you know, have the support team know to give the kid, give her neutral, factual, informational messages. Like we said before, they're information sponges. We like to keep emotions and opinions and criticisms out of the dialogue if we're trying to give them that information because sometimes when we give these emotional uh, uh, messages, they can miscue just on the tone of voice or the facial expression of the person giving that message if it's personal. Um, And then I call it the collegial collaborative casual conversation. You've heard me say this, many of you. We want to brainstorm it together so that we can problem solve together. Um, You know, many of these kids feel they're wrong. They put themselves down. They're very hard on themselves. So we want to take advantage of their good ideas and let them be right as often as possible. That helps them flex. If we're always having them be wrong or doing something wrong or catching them doing something wrong, it makes it, it just makes the challenges, you know, more, more um, in concrete, let me say it that way. And then, um, you know, you have to remember that um, we need to expect the unexpected with our kids. Uh, For example, um, I have a client, the child, well, he's 22, I want to say, Somebody will invite him, let's just say, to go to Wyoming, and he'll say, fine, he'll go. So every, all the plans are made, and everything's happening, and at the very last minute, it comes down to where he backs out. He can't do it, and it throws everybody. What we don't understand is that all these things are novel situations. Novel situations happen every single day of our kids' lives. They happen for all of us, too. But we, for us, we don't even think about them. Our kids don't think about them as novel situations, but it throws them because it is a novel situation. There's some aspect to it that is calling on them to do something that is tricky for them. And so we have to kind of expect that and go with that. But most important as far as I am concerned, is to have the team members not give up with our kids. Don't take things personally. 
Um, don't get angry with our kids and don't be blaming with our kids. Um, you know, because the way we treat a neurotypical kid, it's just not going to work with our kids. Someday it could because if we get our kids to do enough of our challenges in the cycle of it all, we get our kids to start flexing in a way where we can play around with some of this stuff that we use with everybody else. But at first, we need to be, you know, we have to keep thinking counterintuitively. If our communication strategy doesn't work, we have to try other ones. And um, just remember that our kids, they want to be accepted and they want to fit in and they want mm -hmm. to be accepted more than anything in the world. Um, we're, we're almost at, a, at an hour now, so um, uh, is, is there any other question that someone wants to ask at this point? I, I do. Okay. Hi, Judy. It's Meg Fields. Hello, Meg. Hi. Um, I am embarrassed to ask, but I'm trying to figure out what you mean by a new way of messaging. Messaging. <laughs> well, when we start to listen to our kids and the way they use their own words, because everyone has their own personal lexicon. They all have, you, for example, the word school for one kid is going to be a complete trigger word, whereas for another kid it won't mean anything at all. So we, ha we have to understand um, and start to observe and, and have talks with our kids and watch to see what works and doesn't work. And when I talked about messaging, it was in the parent-child or, let's say, mentor-child change cycle. We're going to have to try some things and watch and see what works in our messaging. Sometimes what's important is not to talk at all. That's a really important strategy. A mom just used it this morning. She just emailed me about it just this morning. And it worked because the kid didn't run off and go to his bedroom and slam the door. She said nothing. Great. I call Great. it zip lips. Thank you. Okay. Uh, with that, I think since we're, we're at an, about an hour now, um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll stop. It, I, I hope uh, those who are hearing this uh, have enjoyed it. Um, uh, it uh, I, I think there are so many pearls, and you know, although some of these things that are said by Judy sound maybe inconsequential, it's all these little things that, that make such a huge difference uh, based on my own experience. Um, so, uh, Judy, I want to thank you very much. Um, You're so welcome. I'm so time. glad to have been able to do this. It's something I've wanted to do for a very long time, and I <laughs> many, many more conversations in, in, in the in the till. Great. So um, as I said, I'd like to be doing this on a monthly basis. Um, I'd like to invite Judy back uh, again in a, in a month um, uh, to talk a little further about uh, her, uh, what she calls the uh, SPARK model that she uses, um, and certainly to take other questions from, from, uh, from those who are listening. Um, so uh, with that, uh, again, thank you very much again. And uh, I have everyone's email address who, who signed up for today, and I'll, I'll make sure that you're, you receive information on the next one. Again, feel free to e email me at uh, um, uh, what is the email address? Uh, NVLDAwareness at gmail.com uh, if you have any suggestions. Uh, I do hope to do other uh, seminars like this and other things in the future. So I look forward to your Yeah, and Todd, I mean, I'm happy to uh, also take emails at nldline at aol.com. Great. And, and by the way, I forgot to mention earlier, uh, Judy started one of the first uh, websites uh, about NLD, nldline.com, uh, in what, 1999? Yeah, it's very old and very, um, <laughs> very in need of a, of a rebirth. But it's still got a lot of information. Right, right. Yeah, I think Judy you got 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 busy just working with families by phone, um, but it, it it's a tremendous source of information uh, as well. And Judy's phone number is on that website if anyone needs to contact her that way. 
uh, as well. So again, uh, thanks very much, and uh, uh, have a good night, the rest everyone.